Cat Hill is from Portland, Oregon, where she lives with her husband and Yorkshire Terrier, Baxter. We don't see Baxter right now. Maybe he'll make an appearance. Um, she believes that we can choose joy in our lives no matter what we're faced with. Movement, mindfulness, and gratitude help her navigate the challenge of living with Parkinson's. She's a retired nurse midwife and delivered over 800 babies in her career. Now in her second act, she's an author and advocate for finding wellness after a Parkinson's diagnosis. And I can tell you, after knowing Kat for um, not a very long time, but a, a good meaningful time, is she walks her talk. There is nothing here that she will tell you that she does not do every single day. And she is a just an amazing human being. We're so excited to have her. We love having her as one of our ambassadors. And um, I just know you're gonna love listening to her. So Kat, I'll let you take it away. Hmm. Thank you, Mel. Uh, thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity to chat with you today. Um, it's propitious that I'm here today because today would have been my mom's 79th birthday um, had she been alive. And I'd like to just say happy birthday, mom. Uh, my mom or my mom was a force of nature. She was strong, intelligent, very intellectual. She was an educator and a poet. And she loved people, all people. She especially loved children, all children. And she was spiritual and she held to the belief that each of us has the ability to transcend our current state and to manifest a life that we want. In many ways, my mom was visionary. She believed in the power of our minds. She practiced manifesting a better world for herself before the science was readily available that supported doing that. I greatly admire my mom. You might be able to tell that. And I miss her. She left us too soon, succumbing to her third cancer fight at the age of 72. And she left me and our entire family, though, with a powerful legacy, a legacy that we can affect our own destinies. We can build and manifest the lives we want, no matter the challenge. The year she died was a tough one for our family. We had been caring for mom, helping with treatment, and then ultimately hospice care. And when she lost her battle, we all grieved, of course. Later that year, seven months later, I would be diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's. Looking back, I had the feeling that I wasn't myself for some time. In fact, probably many years. I had fatigue, my foot would, would drag when I was running, my head would bob occasionally. I had some of that internal tremor or anxiety that we all sort of heard about earlier. And all of those symptoms seemed explained away by the busyness of life. I had been practicing for nearly a decade as a nurse midwife, and I was the clinical director of our practice in an inner city hospital in Portland, Oregon. I was honored at the time to be leading our team of midwives. We delivered cutting edge care to a diverse patient population. And in our service, we delivered about 700 babies each year or about a third of the babies born at that hospital. And like Mel said, I had delivered a little over 800 myself. I felt like the I was at the top of my professional game. And it was an extremely demanding role. My on-call years involved many, many hours of being up at a hospital, attending women in labor. As a midwife, it was my role to watch the process unfold and watch carefully for complications and know when to intervene. I loved my work. You might be able to tell that. And I, but it took incredible amounts of my energy to do it. Weekly at home, my husband and I would hold our summit meetings, sitting at a dining room table with calendars and planners in hand, pens and paper and highlighters. We would figure out who was doing what with whom. We had three busy children at home, Cub Scouts, brownies, soccer swim meets, school plays, band performances, teachers conferences. It was a lot. So anything that was going on with my body, I explained away. But looking back, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Midwifery and motherhood are two of the most fulfilling roles I've been honored to play in my life. But I do realize now that the frantic pace of doing it all was perhaps not the healthiest way to live. 
in retrospect, I likely had diagnosed uh, Parkinson's symptoms for at least five years before a formal diagnosis was made. And I, it was only when my right hand, this hand, began to shake uncontrollably, getting my attention, that I finally went in and had follow-up. Like many of you, a few appointments later, the diagnosis came. Bam, young onset Parkinson's. I was 48. I knew what Parkinson's was. My dad and two of my uncles were currently, or at that time, living with the late stages of the disease. My husband's grandfather had died of Parkinson's related complications. I had too many references from my training as a nurse and a nurse practitioner, but I didn't know anybody young and female who had the diagnosis. I, of course, had heard of Davis Finney and knew he had been diagnosed. But how could I have Parkinson's? Why me? Eventually, after my initial shock and grief, I would say, why not me? And I realized that at that moment, I had an opportunity. It was a pivotal time in my life, only like a handful of others, that I got to define how I might define my legacy. How would I face this challenge? I knew that a life blow of a chronic disease can impact many things in life, parenthood, marriage, work, my own self-image. I realized though that I had the choice. I could choose to lay down, curl up in a ball on my sofa, which was very comfortable, watch a lot of television, minimize anything externally that might make me nervous and thus give me symptoms, or I could get up off my sofa and live my life. So ultimately, I chose to live and live intentionally. And what does that mean, live intentionally? Well, for me, it means that I took a look at all of the things in my life, work, parenthood, marriage, friendship, recreation, exercise, study. And I looked at it all in, the, in a lens of what makes me feel good. For once in my life, I gave myself permission to be completely selfish. What did I want? What made me feel good? How did I want to be remembered? And here's the list that I came up with. I know I want to spend time with the people that I love the most for as long as I can. I know that I want to be seen as a positive person and I want to be of service to my community. It's really a pretty simple list. Being with those, for, with those I love the most for as long as I can means that I take care of myself. I exercise. I eat sensibly most of the time. And I consult with a cadre of health professionals that help me manage my disease. I see a counselor. It's a vital piece of my self-care. She helps keep me accountable and on track for some of my decisions and, and choices. I also retired from my beloved career because for me, it was nearly impossible to be selfish and have a healthy balance with the demands. My husband and I right-sized our life and our plans and our finances. We changed some priorities, but it doesn't mean we gave up the things we love the most. We love to travel. For us, it meant buying a vintage trailer, fixing it up ourselves, for trips in, in the States. We save pennies, dimes, quarters, nickels, and frequent flyer mi miles and fly to places on the best deals. We've gotten creative about how we stay places, house trades, sharing houses. And hopefully we'll get back to that after this pandemic. For the second item, being positive. Many people in my world say, well, you were just born po positive. You were born a positive person. And while I believe that's true, it doesn't mean that positive people don't have to work at it. And for me, I started after being down and grieving the initial diagnosis by keeping a gratitude journal. And, and it was a simple, simple process. On my daily calendar, I wrote down three things each day that I was grateful for. And what I started to notice was that I was busy during the day collecting those ideas, 
what was I grateful for? And the more I focused on that, the less I thought of my to-do list or the things that were bugging me in my world. Soon that, that process grew into actually keeping a journal where I, I write down things that I see and do during the day, including some things I'm grateful for. And I started learning to practice mindfully being in the moment. We've heard a lot about that today. Really focusing on now, not yesterday and not tomorrow. I've learned to meditate a little bit. I'm getting better at it. I try to share with other things that have uh, with others, things that are benefiting my life. I co-facilitate or did pre-pandemic a young onset happy hour group. We try to focus on the normal and the positive. I'm super honored to be a Davis Finney ambassador and get to talk to people that are having challenges or might be newly diagnosed. I'm writing and speaking about wellness. I've written, co-authored a book about living intentionally and we're seeking publishers. I got to speak at the World Parkinson's Congress in uh, Kyoto, Japan. I've learned how to do a podcast, things I never thought I would do. So even though I thought that my legacy would be about delivering babies and helping new families, and while it's still a big part of my story, I feel perhaps now the greater part of my legacy will be how I've touched others with Parkinson's disease. Don't get me wrong, I don't think of the diagnosis as a gift, but I have learned to look at it as an opportunity to be of service to others. And I've learned through the science and my research that we can all change the way we, we feel about things and change our brains by the way that we think. In the book of joy, the Dalai Lama and the Reverend Desmond Tutu share stories on the occasion of the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. These are two wise men who have known great adversity and hardships, but they speak about the pearls of joy and a couple of things stick out the most to me. One is about the virtuous circle. And this, this concept talks about if we are not busy thinking of our own hardships, Perhaps that gives us more space in our, in our hearts, in our minds, in our worlds to look at the suffering of others. It also touches on the importance and the need of community and sharing our stories, pandemic or no pandemic. The book also talks a lot about neuroplasticity, and this is a concept we're hearing more and more about. It's the process that we've learned that our brains are constantly changing. We used to think, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And we're finding that not just dogs, but people too can change their brains the whole time we're living. We can lay down new pathways in our brains. It's sort of like when you learn to play a new instrument. The first time you pick it up, you're not very good at it or may not know even how to use it. But over time, the more you practice it, the more automatic it becomes. Well, it's the same way with our brains. If we think that we're feeling well, feeling good, have abundance in our lives, and we cement those pathways, we don't have so much room for the other. Some describe the process of neuroplasticity as a highway. There are only so many lanes of traffic going at any one time. And if we flood those lanes of traffic with positive messaging, I am enough, I am strong, I'm a dancer, I'm, uh, I can move, I have abundance. There's just no room for the lanes of traffic that are, I'm a failure, I'm bad, I don't feel good, all those pieces. It's not to say that I never have a bad or negative thought. This year has tested all of us in so many ways. But what I found is remarkable is that the more that I have stayed grounded and positive, flooding those traffic patterns with positive messages, the better I feel, the less symptoms I have, the less anxious I am. The process of practicing gratitude and mindfulness really works for me. And I suspect it might work for you too. I'm gonna to put on my nurse practitioner hat for just a few minutes and share why I think it works. It makes sense. We've heard a lot about the sympathetic nervous system today, that fight or flight response. It worked great 
in, in primeval days where we had to run from the bear suddenly. But we know that stress activates this. We've heard about it. We even heard about it today. And what happens with those of us with stress, with Parkinson's disease? It increases our symptoms. Today, talking in front of you, I'm a little more shaky than I might be. I'm a little activated. By helping my mind stay grounded in gratitude and present in the moment, I find I don't activate that response as automatically and am therefore less symptomatic. It makes sense. I stumble and fall both figuratively and literally at times. I struggle with painful bilateral dystonia. But I don't want to be defined by those things. I don't want that to be my legacy. Each and every one of us has the opportunity to choose what we're going to focus on in our day. How do you want to be in your world? What are the important parts of your story? How do you want to feel? Every day we can celebrate and focus on our victories. Getting out of bed today was a victory. Showing up is a victory. Being present today is a victory. And just being is a victory. How you use or choose to use your brain and how you focus your thoughts is up to you. And you hold that power. I wish you all great joy and wellness. And I thank you all so much for being here today. 